have been resolved. Um, welcome to the June meeting of the Regional Housing Committee for the Lower Connecticut River Valley Council of Governments. Um, we have one item on the agenda today after uh, one bookkeeping item, which is approval of minutes, and then our scheduled workshop where we're going to go through uh, a pro some some summary in the beginning that Megan's going to do, and and then get into the real sleeves up workshop part of it. So, um, first item up on the agenda. Actually, you want to roll? You have the attendance. I do. Yeah. Um, from Chester, we have Pat Bands and Bonnie Bennett. Um, from Deep River, Daniel Smith. Um, from Clinton, is that you, Abby? Maybe. Um, from Essex, we have David Rosengren. Um, from Lyme, we have David Long. From Middletown, we have Mara Kozakowski. From Old Lyme, we have Michael Fogliano. We don't have him. From Westbrook, we have Eric Salmon. Um, Bill Neal is also here. Hello. Um, I see Carla Lindquist from Hope Partnership. I see Ben Lovejoy from Department of Housing. Um, I see Stuart Aber from Cromwell coming in online. Um, and I'm Eliza Lopresti. We also have Mar Marcos Gonzalez, Susie Beckman, Megan Jufless, and Sam Gold from River Cloud staff. Did I miss anyone? And that is Abby from Clinton. Her microphone's not working. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, good. Um, so the one housekeeping item we have is approval of the May 28th minutes. Um, get a motion to approve for discussion purposes. So moved. Uh, any amendments, submissions, corrections? No. Nope. Hearing none, we go to a vote. All in favor of approving the minutes of May 22nd, May 28th, I'm sorry. Aye. 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 Um, who was the second on that? Did you have a second? Did you have a second? Yes, sir. Neil, did you second? Thank you. Did you second the motion? No, no, I'll, I'll second it. I'm just I'm coming. Thank you. Just give me a second. Oh. Any opposed? And I'm going to abstain because I wasn't there. Okay. Okay. Um, so we can jump in now. Um, Megan? Just go for it. Turn over to you. And we had, we had some ground rules we're going to do because we're in the mix. You want to start with that? Yeah. And... So, um, Eliza, I, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get this presentation up so that everyone online can see it. We do have folks that are joining us online. They can see us via the owls, even though only Eliza can see them and me for now. Um, what we're going to do is start with the folks in the room and then if there are comments, um, hang on. I can't do two things at the same time. <laughs> Clones Deep River entered the waiting room. I have, and also my. Oh, that's Carol. Okay. Uh, sharing the screen and popping up the screen. Okay. So anyways, as I was saying, um, if there are comments online, please raise your hand or type them into the chat box. And I'll likely going to be facilitating that as we get into the workshop part. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through a presentation that kind of summarizes and synthesizes all the information that we've been reading over the last couple of months from our case studies, kind of level set and make it something that is hopefully easier to work with. Um, I would ask that we reserve questions until the end so that we can get through it. Um, and then we'll leave. It'll probably take me 25 or so minutes to do the presentation. We'll have a couple of minutes for questions and then we'll get into the workshop activity, which will be on this very high budget board that we have behind me here, um, which uh, it should be a lot of fun, and hopefully the presentation will set that up nicely. But we want to save most of the time for doing the actual workshop. So um, please bear with me. 
And without further ado, um, I will get into this presentation. So welcome everybody to workshop two for the regional housing needs assessment methodology for RENA, as I'll be referring to it. Uh, for this presentation, first, I will remind everyone what a regional housing needs assessment is, and then we'll do key takeaways from the reading material, our four case studies, California, New Hampshire, Oregon, and Washington. Um, you'll see them in sort of a high level um, equation format. I'm going to use that phrase very loosely. Uh, and then I'll go over some instructions for our workshop exercise. So first of all, a quick reminder, what is ARENA? So Regional Housing Needs Assessment. And this is from our first workshop presentation, just a refresher. It's a method of using quantitative and qualitative data to calculate the gap in the current and future supply and demand for different housing types. So basically, what do we have? What do we need? What's that in the middle? And why are we doing ARENA for RiverCog? So the first short answer is that it's a recommendation in RiverCog's regional housing plan that was adopted by the board. It was delegated as a task to the Regional Housing Committee by the board, and you'll see in the little blue box there, that's from our bylaws for this group that says the Regional Housing Committee should be tasked with creating ARENA every five years to support future updates to the Municipal Affordable Housing Plans. Those are your 830J plans. Um, we can talk about the five-year benchmarks later. We're going to park that for now. It will come up. Um, and then the second reason is it's kind of a response to the state housing needs assessment study that came out of the Open Communities Alliance bill um, that did not pass, but uh, the state is planning to have a draft for housing needs assessment in January, 2025. So we want to be fully informed on what we like before we get to that point so that we can be an engaged partner in those discussions. So what are some common steps in the RENA process? There's not one way to do a methodology. We've seen that through the case studies, but there are some common steps that we regularly see for all of them. So the first step is determination. That's how many units do we need? Uh, that's typically done at the state level, passed to the region, and then to the municipalities. And it's always separated by income category, although the income categories do tend to vary. The second step is allocation. So once you have that total number, you have to figure out who gets them, uh, who needs to plan for the unit. And this is usually done at the regional level and then to the local level. And then the third we haven't really talked about, but that's that last step of accommodation. So how do these units fit into the municipality? It's local planning to accommodate the unit. Very importantly, planning to accommodate, not to build. So the real meat of this presentation is the key takeaway. So I'll go through each of the four case studies and break them into those three steps. We'll talk about determination, allocation, and accommodation. So starting in California, all right, so here's my very loosely described equation for all of the components. And I wanted to make it visual and something that we might be able to emulate on our board. So for now, just be thinking about the things that you like, the things that you don't, and what makes sense. And we're keeping it at a high level. So try not to, not to worry too much about how the calculations were made. It's more about whether you like the inputs or not. And we can figure out how to calculate them as a next step. So you'll see that all of these equations start with future need equals. That's what we're trying to solve for. So for the purposes of this discussion, future need is broadly the total number of units that are needed to support the future population by the end of our projection period, whether that's five years or 10 years or 20 years. The goal is to establish a healthy housing market that reasonably provides for everyone, especially those at the lower end of the income spectrum. Sorry, I'm trying to find my, there's my mouse. Oh. <laughs> Hang on. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's a it does. All right, well, fortunately, I think I have a touch screen, so we'll just do this. Um, okay, so looking at California, 
The base for the, ter the determination is future households. So they get this by looking at the projected population less group quarters divided by household size. And group quarters are people that don't need their own independent unit. So we're thinking dorms, we're thinking senior living facilities, um, military barracks, those kinds of things. To that base, we add units to address an unhealthy vacancy rate for renters and owners, overcrowding, which is defined as more than one person per room, not per bedroom, but per room in a house, uh, and then average housing unit replacement from demolition. So you're replacing units that are being torn down. And you could kind of summarize these three things as measuring underproduction or deficiencies in your current supply. And then from this new number of units, we subtract the total number of occupied units at the start of the projection period. So the goal of that is to isolate your future units out of your total. And then you add the number of cost burdened households. Your definition, cost burden, we should all be familiar with, is those spending more than 30% of their income on housing or housing related expenses. And here, it's not just a flat number of cost burdened households that they're subtracting. Um, it's calculated as a measure relative to a set benchmark. So how many cost burdened households do you have relative to the state average? And then that difference is what you're accommodating. And then these are all distributed by income category. Again, the income breakdown and how they get to the income breakdown from the total determination is something we can park and worry about yeah. later, but I put it here so that we can reference, you know, it happens. They look at very low, low, moderate, and above moderate income households. That's the first one. We made it. So the second step in California is allocation. So again, you're taking that future need that you came up with in the first step, and you're passing it to from the state to the regions in the allocation stage. So for our reading material, we looked at SANDAG or San Diego Association of Governments as an example of how regions do this allocation. So what SANDAG did was they took the need from the previous slide and pass it out to municipalities based on share of transit and share of jobs. So 65% of the total determination went to municipalities with access to transit, 75% for rail and rapid bus, and 25% to major transit stops. And then 35% went to jurisdictions based on the number of jobs they had. So to put this in numbers, um, if you had 1,000 units, 650, be that 65%, goes to municipalities proportional to their regional share of transit stations. And then the, so that would be 487 to those with rail and rapid bus and 163 to those with major transit stops. And then 350 would go to jurisdictions based on regional share mm -hmm. of jobs. And this whole allocation methodology is based on the idea that jobs and housing should be balanced. So people should either live where they work or be able to access it conveniently via transit. And then lastly, once all of those units have been kind of doled out on a roster to the different municipalities, they do an equity adjustment. So the total number of units in the allocation go up or down based on their existing share of units in each income category. So in other words, a municipality that has a very large share of very low income housing units their allocation share for that bracket would go down because they already have a very large supply. And on the flip side, if you had a very large existing supply of very high income housing units, your share in that bracket would go down. So it's kind of to balance out so that not all of the very low or very high income housing units are being allocated to the same places and nobody has too many of any one type. And then lastly, accommodation, the third step for California. Um, all municipalities, once they've received their allocation, have to plan to meet the housing needs. Uh, this is accomplished through what they call a housing element. And it's kind of like a section in your POCD, except longer and a lot more technical. Um, you have to include in that an inventory of all your vacant sites or sites that could be developed or redeveloped for residential and do an analysis of the relationship between the zoning and infrastructure and those sites. 
And then you have to have a quantification of the resources that you have available to address the housing needs and the constraints and to promote the development of the housing in those areas. If anybody in the room needs cookies or soda or fruit to keep them engaged as we keep going, now is a great time to go get some snacks. Um, the people online should come to get snacks. <laughs> so our next one is New Hampshire. Um, we're we're going to go through the same steps, starting with determination. So again, you're going to see that same base in future households, which is, in this case, projected population less the current population over housing size. Here, they don't include group quarters. That's different from California. It was discussed in the reading, except that they decided that the number of units difference by including group quarters wasn't going to be worth the trouble of calculating them. Um, and then also a difference is instead of subtracting the existing units, we subtract out current population before we calculate the households. So it's two means to the same end. You're still isolating the future households out of the total number. It's just you're doing it at the population stage as opposed to the household stage. And then the only other input in this methodology is vacancy. So very similar to us, the population in New Hampshire isn't experiencing a ton of growth, but it's still seeing housing prices increase. And this is due to a really constrained supply. So the study saw establishing a healthy vacancy rate as an important way to increase the supply just enough to allow mobility between units and to reduce the competition for each individual unit. So the ultimate goal was creating a more balanced housing market. For example, if you have only one unit per person, then there's no place for that person to go in your community if they decided they wanted to sell and switch units. And then that also means that every time a unit does become available, there is a massive interest and it skyrockets the price due to the competition. So what they did was they used the existing breakdown of homeowners and renters and they just projected that out into the future. So they had 71% homeowners and 29% renters. They assumed that would continue and they applied a 5% vacancy rate for renters and a 2% vacancy rate for owners and added that to their total future need. So for allocation, the future needs were allocated to municipalities based on population growth and job growth. So 50% of the units were doled out based on proportional share of population growth to different municipalities, and then 50% was doled out based on proportional share of job growth. From the initial breakdown then, each allocated share could be adjusted up or down based on a couple of different factors. And this was um, recommendations from New Hampshire. So this could be used or not in different regions, uh, depending on what was agreed upon between the region and the municipality. So it's a real partnership discussion. Uh, so the options were uninhabitable units, buildable land and infrastructure, level of opportunity using an opportunity index and share of community resources. So again, this methodology is a partnership between municipalities and the region. So um, there's agreement beforehand in the allocation of which measures would be used in these adjustments, um, what that measure would be, and the scale to which the adjustments would be made. And then that would be applied universally to the municipalities in the region. And then getting to accommodation, Similar to California, the municipalities have to plan to accommodate the future housing needs. This is a much less formal version. So there's a capacity test worksheet that the state created that municipalities can use to determine the amount of buildable land. And it accounts for water bodies, wetlands, steep slope, et cetera. Um, these, they can feed the results from this capacity worksheet back to the regional allocation, and that can be used as an adjustment, uh, or it can be used by the municipality to plan for the units. And again, my understanding is that this needs to be agreed upon across the municipalities and everyone would get the same treatment. So you would either use it in your municipality to feed into the regional allocation, or you wouldn't, and everyone has to do the same. 
Moving on to Oregon. So same thing, determination. In Oregon, there are three inputs for determining future need. You have future households plus under production plus homelessness. Future households is gonna look a lot similar to what we've seen. Um, it's projected population over household size, except here, instead of using a vacancy rate, Oregon used the national average of units per household. And this is their way of creating the flexibility in the housing market. So they multiply households by the national unit per household rate of 1.14, or 14% more units than there are households. To future households, we then add the amount of housing that we should have based on current households. So using that national vacancy rate again, they're looking at the, the ratio of units to households we have now and finding the difference between that and the national average. And whatever that difference is, times that by the number of households, that's how many additional units you should have because that's kind of your underproduction based on where that healthy market rate is. And then finally, um, oh, actually I should add before I get there. Um, the report specifically states that underproduction is a key reason that housing markets experience rising prices, kind of like what we talked about in the previous example. So if a region has less than 1.14 units per household, housing is going to be scarce and the pricing is going to rise. This most greatly impacts households at the lowest income brackets who are going to struggle to find scarce units. But it's also going to contribute to cost burden because everyone is going to be bumping up in cost brackets for what they are paying for their housing costs. And interestingly, this report specifically rejects the idea of using cost burden as a measure of housing shortage. So it states that simply summing the number of cost burden households and saying that's the housing shortage would project an oversupply in housing because cost burden households do in fact have existing units, even if they're not units they can afford. So if they're able to vacate those units, those units are then available. And lastly, then getting back into the methodology here, uh, to determination, we add housing to account for the unhoused. So this starts with the point in time count, which measures homelessness. But recognizing that this count often falls substantially short, we add 60% as an undercount measure. And then they also happen to have a study that was conducted of unhoused students at college age, um, students living in cars or couch surfing or whatnot. And they added that to their homeless population. Allocation. So second step. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, later. Um, so Oregon has something that we don't have that plays a really big part in their allocation, and that's an urban growth boundary. So I mentioned this at the last workshop, but an urban growth boundary is basically the delineation between an urban center where growth should be directed and then the rural areas where growth should be limited. And this is in the Oregon Constitution. It's kind of fundamental to the way they do land use. However, just because we don't have an urban growth boundary doesn't mean we can't emulate some of the concepts here by directing growth towards specific areas using some other measure. And we can talk about that when we get to the exercise. Um, so in Oregon, housing needs are allocated based on whether a municipality is in the urban growth boundary or out of the urban gro growth boundary. So if you're out of the growth boundary, you are only allocated your share of future households, and it's 100% based on your proportional share of regional population. Uh, so that's kind of status quo. If you're inside the urban growth boundary, then you are responsible for your share of future households, but also under production and homelessness. So in other words, all underproduced units and all units to accommodate homelessness will be allocated to municipalities that are in the urban growth boundary. And 50% of those are based on a proportional share of population. And then 50% is based on proportional share of current jobs. And then I should also note in this methodology, transportation, proximity, and commute flows were considered, but were ultimately not used in the allocation. They ultimately selected jobs instead as the best available data. Um, but transit was recommended for municipalities to use in their 
local accommodation for planning for unit. And then accommodation. So in Oregon, as in our other case studies, municipalities have to plan to accommodate their allocation of units. They do a housing capacity analysis um, that's conducted by the municipality. They look at buildable land and zoning. And they're trying to identify whether there is enough buildable land that is appropriately zoned in order to accommodate the units. And the answer to this will ultimately need to be yes, which means sometimes something needs to be changed to make sure that you can accommodate the units on buildable land. Uh, and then you also have to follow that up with a housing production strategy um, that's gonna propose actions that the municipality is gonna take to encourage those units to be produced. So how do you spur some development? And our very last one, into Washington, which is not the best one to do at the end. In hindsight, I should have moved these around. Um, so in Washington, future needs are calculated by adding current need to future growth. So current need is existing cost burden renter households, not owner households, plus the number of homeless households. And the report gives three reasons for excluding cost burdened owner households from the methodology. First, they say owner households are in a fundamentally different financial position than renter households because they do have equity in an appreciating asset that provides them additional options. Second reason is because some of these owner households are retired and may have access to savings and other resources that they're not reporting as income. And then third, they say there are better tools and programs that local jurisdictions can and absolutely should use to help reduce the cost of home ownership for lower income households. Therefore, they determined that building new housing units for these households to occupy is not necessarily the best or only solution. So back to our methodology here. Current need is then subtracted from the net new units to give us future growth. Net new units is going to look really familiar, projected households minus group quarters over household size. And to this, they add a 6% vacancy and subtract out the existing units to isolate the future units. So the interesting thing about Washington is that they subtract the current need from the net new units. Uh, this means that if your population isn't growing or is growing very slowly, and or you have a very high current need or underproduction, you may find yourself with a negative number of units. So in that case, uh, they've determined that your determination is going to be limited to the current need only. Just ignore future growth and just focus on your current need. It's kind of a cop out, but it's fine. <laughs> um, so allocation here is a little tricky to wrap your head around. I'm going to do my best. Um, we didn't look at a specific regional example. We looked at the guidance from the state. So the state gives two options for a base allocation plus adjustment. So the first option, units are allocated based on the municipality's share of population growth by its percentage share of new units in each income bracket. So this methodology assumes that each municipality is going to accommodate the same proportion of units in each income bracket relative to its existing population. So for an example, if the allocation of units at 80% AMI is 20%, every municipality is going to get a 20% share of units at 80% AMI. Town X has a population of 100 households, of growth, 100 household growth projection, Town Y has a thousand person growth projection. Town X would be allocated 20 units at 80% AMI and Town Y would be allocated 200 at 80% AMI. So the numbers are different because the growth projections are different, but it's still 20%. So everyone gets 20%. Oops. I was so excited I got through it that I just... <laughs> The second one is the equity model. So units in this are allocated based on the municipality's share of population growth by its percentage of total unit share. So it assumes that some of the units are going to be accounted for in the existing supply. 
So instead of measuring percentage based on new units only, your allocated units relative to the share of your existing units in each income category. So kind of like our California equity adjustment, if you have a large share in a certain bracket, then your allocation in that bracket is going to go down. But ultimately, each municipality is going to end up with total share relative to their population. Um, and in some cases, that share may end up feeling larger than their total growth projection, in which case you are needing to um, find ways to make your existing supply more affordable to fit in a different bracket. So, and then adjustments can be made to either of those um, options based on any combination of these. So you have land capacity, jobs, transit, services, opportunity, and supply, a lot of the same stuff we've been seeing throughout the case studies. I should also note that Washington has an option to go your own way and not do either of these two options. I'm willing to guess that a lot of places choose to do that. We may also. Uh, and then finally, last one, accommodation looks similar to other case studies. So municipalities first do capacity analysis um, to accommodate their allocation of units. It's based on buildable land and the build out analysis under existing zoning. So you look at your buildable land, that's not vacant land, it's buildable. So you can look at redevelopment opportunities as well. Um, so long as it's not, you know, wetlands or steep slope or things like that. So your buildable land and you analyze the build out analysis under your current zoning. So if everybody built on all of those sites maxed out at capacity for what your zoning allows, could you accommodate your allocation of units? And if you can't, then you have to go back and do it again. So you have to identify and implement zoning changes for the buildable land that would increase your capacity on the buildable land. And then you repeat the analysis until you can show that based on the zoning changes, your allocation of units can be accommodated on the buildable land that you have. So summary, we made it. Uh, first step, determination, what are the similarities across the case studies? Um, they typically are based on a projection of future households. We saw that across all of them. They're aiming to establish healthy vacancy rates across income levels, although they do that in different ways and at different percentages. They can also account for existing deficiencies in supply, such as overcrowding, homelessness, cost burden, underproduction, et cetera. For allocation, always allocated by income brackets. Again, the breakdown can vary. We're not gonna worry too much about that right now. It usually starts with a base allocation that can be adjusted up or down by various factors. And typical base allocations are share of population growth, sometimes also jobs. Uh, common adjustments include equity, land capacity, transit, and existing supply. Mm -hmm. And accommodation, so across the board, municipalities are responsible for planning for the units, not building them. Municipalities decide where additional units can be accommodated by zoning appropriately. And analysis typically includes build out under current zoning and where needed changes that allow the growth to occur. And then in some cases, the land capacity analysis is done at the municipal level and fed back to the region before the allocation happens. We did it. So, <laughs> workshop activity. So, Based on all of that, we're going to be working with these three boards, and I'm going to stand next to them once we start going. So hopefully, Eliza, you can tell me if they'll be able to see it on the screen. Yeah. Um, so we've got the three boards here, determination, how many, allocation, who gets them, local accommodation, how do they fit? And we've got all of the inputs that we saw in the presentation up on the board. And we started plugging in the typical stuff, but once we get up there, we're gonna move stuff around. You'll also notice we've got little papers all over the desks and markers. So we'll start with what's up there, but then we can also turn it to you to see if there's something that we haven't considered yet that hasn't been talked about that should go up there, either on its own or under one of these other categories. Again, we're keeping this really high level. 
So this is kind of, if we have all the data and we can do what we want, what do we want to put in here? Um, we can, you know, the goal is for the next methodology workshop to look at what data sources are available. So we would take back what we hear from you today, try and wrangle it into a methodology that looks like what we had in the presentation. And we'll bring it back to you along with a list of data sources that would account for each of those items. In some cases, it may be perfect. There may be no further need for discussion. In other cases, we may have to say, we don't have this data, we can't get it, it's not reliable, here's something else we might use, or we could drop the item altogether and try to accommodate it elsewhere in the methodology. Uh, so as we're going through this, we need to consider for each item that we're putting on the boards, what's the goal of including it? Does including it accomplish the goal that we're trying to get at? Is there something else that's already on the board that's gonna accomplish that goal and does it do it better or should we switch it? And are we placing it on the correct board for the purpose? So is it part of the determination of how many units? Is it more about where those units go? Or is it really a local issue that the region should butt out of and we should leave it to the towns to worry about? So that's, the presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing. <laughs> I don't understand, but a fraction of it. No, no, no. Really good job. Yeah. Thank you. I need a nap now. Um, so I guess now it's questions. Um, yeah. So uh, one thing I think what might be uh, just useful just in, in sort of giving us a little perspective is the years that these, how long have these different methodologies been used? And I think for when it comes to Oregon or California, Washington, it's been a while. Yeah. These are not new methodologies. No, we're talking, you know, California started doing this in the 70s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How in, successful have they been? <laughs> in creating housing or in doing the methodology? <laughs> creating the housing. Creating the housing. So they are creating a lot of housing. I think... The problem that you'll find is in some locations that have a really high amenity value, people are always going to want to go there. So you can't build yourself out of it. There's always going to be too high of a demand. Um, and I think California is in that boat, particularly if you're thinking San Francisco or you're thinking San Diego, Los Angeles, and the cities. They're all, you know, they're always going to have that sort of a problem. For us, our population is not particularly growing. So we may be able to course correct before we get to that point, would be the hope. I had a question. In Oregon, they added homeless to the population. So is that saying that the census doesn't even try to get homelessness? Yeah, they they said that the homeless population is not accounted for in the total population. They're usually not counted. So, so the census agrees. Does the census agree with that? I would have to take a look. That's what the study says. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how I mean, they really could be counted in the census unless the census takes the point in time count and adds it. Money. But I don't know if that do the um, percentage on top of it. Right. That Oregon does the undercount. Yeah, because you think about how. Typically, when you're filling out the census, right, it's based on where you're living. You're getting stuff delivered to you to fill out your census. But the census does their own adjustments to the data they gather. Mm -hmm. So we're saying we're saying they're wrong. They think they think they're right, but we're saying they're wrong. Well, Oregon is saying they're wrong. Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. But, yeah. but they're, they're saying yeah. the census is incorrect in that area. Yeah. I think yeah. Oregon too has a pretty severe homeless problem that we don't have. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I mean, like true. out of those four states, so, mm -hmm. Washington yeah. as well. But yeah. Oregon, California too. But, California, yeah, yeah, hugely. Yeah. And what's an urban growth boundary and maybe examples of? Yeah, so in um, in Oregon, the urban growth boundary is sort of a line on the map that says this is where we're going to concentrate growth. And it's reevaluated, I believe, every 10 years to see if it needs to expand to accommodate future population. But it's basically a 
artificial boundary that you know, is used to concentrate all development. And there are limits if you're not in the urban growth boundary for how much you are allowed to change your zoning regulations to allow for more growth. If, if, you, if you go on like Google Earth or whatever, it's actually pretty wild where you can see density and then nothingness yeah, sort of on like the other side. England and, England and France. Yeah, this is how it's done in Europe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and 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 if you do even more detail, in Oregon, they're supposed to accommodate 20 years worth of growth in their urban growth boundary. So the boundary is adjusted over time to, so they have enough land to accommodate that growth. But it's about centralizing the development in those in those cities. And then out in the rural areas, you may have zoning, agricultural zoning, which is one unit per 150 acres, okay. uh, which is the strictest that you want anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. Apple it, farms, wineries. Yep. Yeah. Uh, does anyone online have any questions? No. All right. So we do one first, or do we do them all at the same time? All right. Or... So now it's my Vanna White moment. So it only comes down to over here. And I think the best way to do this is we started plugging in, like I said, what we heard. So in determination, we saw across the board, future need is future households, right? So we've got projected population over household size, less existing units. First question, are we okay generally with this as a starting point? Move to the other side. So it's determining how many new, yeah. not how many total. Right, correct. And, and if you could read it out for the people online. Okay. Yeah. Projected population <laughs> over household size minus existing units. Can they see that? Uh, they cannot probably read the words. Okay. But they can see that that exists. <laughs> there is a board. <laughs> there are cards. Yeah. So, I mean, there are a couple of different ways that we could calculate this. You know, we saw you could do, you could subtract, you know, projected population minus current population divided by household size to get there. Or you could do your population over your household size and get the household and then subtract your existing unit. So there, it's kind of two different ways to get to the same end. We could play with what those differences look like, but generally speaking, are we okay with starting with a basis of future household? Maybe a twist on household size because household size is not static. Mm -hmm. So you have to make an active decision on whether you take current household size, some sort of average projected household size, because the census data says household sizes are shrinking. Correct. So yeah. we're and gonna have to, I think we need to, yes, in terms of the concept of household size, but I think we need to refine what what household size means. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. And I think, you know, right now we're still at the high level concept of what are the inputs? So how specifically we calculate those? And I think that's a really good point. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna need, Marcus, can I grab you? And can you bring some cards? And the marker. projected household size for that. So it not projected how projected population over projected household size. Mm -hmm. right? And yes. you can figure out what projected means. Yeah. I was just going to make a note of that on a card to go yeah. right underneath. Yeah, just to add to that is that you right. could have stagnant population growth, but a shrinking household size that drives your need for housing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so uh, if the equation would show that you need housing, mm -hmm. uh, even though your population is stagnant, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, that'd be a useful. If we take the current trend and just extend it, then the population mm -hmm. is going to go down in, in our region. And I don't think anybody thinks that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, because at some point there's going to be some sort of recursive effect if you change policies that, that maybe encourage the growth and then you won't go down that path. Um, but, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Carla's saying it's important um, to think about climate impacts on interstate migration. Northeast may become a more attractive destination in the next 20 years as other parts of the country become too hot and or wet. So that's um, yeah, under projected population, we just put climate consideration. I'm migrating. Yeah. Okay. So we had a comment for climate migration that 
<laughs> might impact our projected population for people mm -hmm. coming here. So we're going to add that to our projected population. So again, are we generally okay with these inputs? Because we have these optional inputs over to the side that we may or may not also want to add. And that's kind of what New Hampshire had, right? Right. So for example, we have vacancy rate. The reason for the vacancy rate was to allow mobility between the units. We're not going to worry too much right now about what percentage across the case studies. It was kind of like, well, between two and eight percent is good for a vacancy rate. And, you know, sometimes it was we picked four because it's in the middle. Um, so we can figure out what that means to us. But do we want to include vacancy or perhaps do we want to measure national unit or household average? Do we like the concept of a buffer? And does one of these appeal more? Two part question. Well, I'll just say like the vacancy rate is what keeps prices somewhat rational because if you get to a very low vacancy rate, then it gets to whatever, whoever can pay the most. Yeah. So do you want exactly the number of units for the projected population or do we want to allow some of that flexibility to try and reduce the cost burden? Flexibility. I mean, vacancy rate. Yeah, and more so than the national unit. To me, that was. It was strange. Fourteen percent is high too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I like that. Actually, these are getting a little bit too close. So I'm going to move them. I'm going to put this here. And can I get a marker? Perfect. We're in the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. We're currently at 3.8% for 2023. Mm -hmm. Is that national? Um, um, or, or renters? I mean, I think this is for rental vacancy. Okay, okay. renters. Yes. How do we feel about current underproduction? So, right now, this is future needs only. We haven't accounted for current shortage if we have it. Yeah, so, this is a good yeah. show, especially for yeah. Connecticut. Every, yeah, we have every, a lot. every newspaper really mentions 80 to 90,000 yeah. units short. Right. But every that's day. because they are only measuring based on existing number of cost burden households. Can we that's talk about the, that a little bit? Yeah. Generally, Why? Oh, I was just going to say, generally, 10,000 units is the number that's listed um, in terms of shortage for just sheer households that are doubled up or, you know, like an adult who wants to leave but can't find housing. So that's the number that we hear irrespective of cost. Is that statewide? Yes. Okay. So that would be an overcrowding, correct? Or no, not yeah. overcrowding, just multiple households, regardless of number of rooms in the unit. It's 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 a it's a deficit in supply relative to demand. So I understand that. I'm just trying to think if we're thinking in terms of a measurement of what that is. We're not technically talking overcrowding because overcrowding is more than one person in a room right it's not overcrowding so in some cases it might be but that that's not you know that's not the the standards is that an input in the household size it might be an input in a household size i mean i'm trying to think if you've got a kid that's trying to leave and they are stuck in their parents house because they don't have a unit what would you call that for counting it? It's, it's sort of unmet demand. Unfortunate. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the More unfortunate goals. Yeah. That's, that's a vacancy problem. It is a vacancy problem. I agree. That might come under vacancy. So maybe Three we minutes. put doubled up households and I'll put that under vacancy. I'm trying to think through it. If you do the math, if if you start at the beginning there, where you do your inventory based on and, and the inventory is stratified by income demographic, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so if you carry that all the way through, I'm thinking the um, underproduction should fall out from that math, right, and not need to be separated. If you if you 
you start with your current inventory, it'll stratify by and it's it was stratified by income, and then you look at your future needs stratified by income, it should fall out of that. And the same goes for cost burden. Uh, my my goal would be to be today, it more, more negative than sorry. Yeah. More yeah. simple. I mean, I think some of the like Washington to me made my head spin. Yeah. I mean, I think the idea is to the extent you're saying, right, that you could put these things together, that, that you're going to get it in these numbers. Do you yeah. need to add another factor that makes it the underproductive? I don't know if you need to plug it. So I think it is accounting for, so this is only looking at your future population, but if you have a current underproduction where you have an overcrowding situation or doubled up households. Um, the future is based on subtracting out the current. So if the current is You're subtracting out the current, right. so you're not including them. So if there's underproduction, then the future is going to be bigger mm. than if you didn't have underproduction. I'm not following that. It's like you're saying currently you need number. more now. Yeah. So that that's what you're saying. You're needing more now. So if you already need more now, what is the additional factor that should carry through to the future? Yes, I agree. But, <laughs> okay. So how do you want to put that on the board? So we're not we're saying we don't like including underproduction. We want to only look at future. Uh, no, not that we ignore, no. but the Thank but you. that it's already considered, I think. But I can, if, if let's say you have a rate of of people per household, mm -hmm. and you have a population, mm -hmm. and you have a number of a number of units, right? If 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 the population's greater than, then if, if it comes out that you're let's say one point five instead, of, and and you want one point one four, you already have the. A, a, a shortage. Yeah. Isn't it partly vacancy rate too? I mean, the, the idea that vacancy rate yeah. gets something to me in terms of underproduction. You're, you're getting yeah. a piece of it, maybe not the whole thing. So what I'm trying to figure out is where to put this or if I take it off. So I'm thinking then that it might go there or and or it might also get captured here. Or are we saying we don't want to subtract existing units? We want to go up here and subtract existing population. I understand the goal that we're trying to get at. I'm just trying to figure out where the inputs might go. And that could be something, if we know we want to incorporate underproduction somewhere, that could just be something that we leave on the board as a factor. So what I'm asking is underproduction already considered in the model and does not need a plug. So if we just if you had 10 households at 50% AMI, okay, and you had six units uh -huh. today, uh -huh. okay, you're starting off negative four. Right. And if that and if the future projection so you would increases have to... that 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 negative four, that underproduction would carry through. In, in the way this math is done. Right, so you would have to add the four units. Because it would to... show up as, because your your future, in, your current inventory would, for that income demographic would show as negative, not as a positive number. Just want to throw this out here that like standing up here trying to do math in, in real time is like my worst nightmare from the <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, the, the, um, the, the, the San Diego model kind of did it that way. They had today, in parentheses and tomorrow in parentheses. Uh -huh. I think that's kind of what you're saying, right? Okay, today population households, um, whatever over and under, and then tomorrow either adds to it or subtracts from it. So I guess what I'm saying, and, and I maybe maybe I have this completely wrong. So I need to check me on it. But it sounds like if you do the math the way at the, the very beginning, the projected the the current population and current inventory. Yeah. If that's done by categorized by AMI, it's it's possible to get a negative number for your current inventory, yeah. mm -hmm. which means that would that would carry through to your to your future need by increasing it. Right. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and, and also, I think I think it was interesting about your vacancies might not be where you need them. Right. Yeah, it, right. It, it could be the mansions exactly. that are vacant or the very expensive units that are vacant. And the affordable units are are all full. Uh, yeah, are all full. Yeah. Yes. So just confirming the the current inventory is going to be 
is not going to be one number. It's going to be broken out in all the Correct. income categories. So, Correct. Yeah, okay. so, so with that in mind, any one, any one of those could be negative. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Which means it's going to carry through. So my question to you, do we like this, where we're subtracting the current population from the projected population before we divide household size? Or we want to do projected population into households first and then subtract the existing units, or does it not matter? Mm -hmm. And again, this, this is something simpler. in time. <laughs> New Hampshire seems simpler uh, and, and more common to what we need in Connecticut than Oregon and my, and, or my field. And, and also, if this is done as an iterative process, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on a, a every every year, every few years, then you can have an adjustment for household size. Right. Yes. So can we put... Um, and just confirm things, so projected population is not one number. It's projected population by income demographic. It depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. in some cases, you do the calculation first and then split it out into income categories. Mm -hmm. In some cases, you do it at the start. So, but I feel like that's a little bit too deep in the rabbit hole for what we're trying to accomplish today. I don't know that we need to have the calculation specifically, except that we know we want to account for the units that we are short based on the total population that we have, correct? Unit shortage. Right. That's what we're trying to account for. I would call that under production. I could add. Doesn't New Hampshire get to that though? Because they are saying, you're getting to renters. You're saying you want to have a 5% vacancy rate. You would now have a 3% vacancy rate. Yeah. You're finding that you need now more. So I think they get to it. So it's for that, it's applying, it goes back to where Michael's at, right? If that number carries through, because the way they've applied it, they're applying it to the future units, not the difference. So if you're looking at, um, was it Oregon that used the national average, right? They're saying we're applying the national average to the future projection because that's what we need in future units. We're then going to look at our existing population to households and apply it to that. You know, so we'll see what our current ratio is, or in other words, what our current vacancy rate is as compared to the national average. And we need to add the number of units to bump up our current supply to meet that national average. We're going to add that number. It to depends the on when you're deciding when the projected population mm -hmm. is. Is the projected population two years from now? You're going to get that. Or is it 10 years from now? Right. So it's two years from now, you're, or even tomorrow. Mm -hmm you're going to get some of that, I think. Yeah, Susie, any question? Um, are we taking into consideration with these calculations the balance we want to have in the types of households that we have? Do we want to make space for more people at a lower income? I'm just thinking of the cog as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, it's that breaking it out. Right. It gets back to breaking it out. But if we're looking at current population and projected population, we may not be attracting people at the lower end of the spectrum. And if we stick to the numbers that we have now as a projection, okay, yeah. <laughs> we can put this up here. Uh, well, I, I don't know if that's you know, where it goes, I just wanted to mm -hmm. throw yeah. that out as a consideration while we're talking about Absolutely. calculations. What does that one say that you had in your hand? Equity. Oh, that, I was going to say, I was going to echo exactly what Susan said. Yeah. Which is that I, I'm, con I'm a little confused about what we're trying to do because, you know, I just keep thinking concrete here. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're in essence. Okay. And there's a lot of competition for high end housing, right? But I don't know how many people on the lower end are even want to move here. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I really don't because I, quite frankly, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an aging white privileged population with wonderful school systems yeah. with a very high rate of kids getting into good schools 
at public schools. Well, that's and freaking though. Putting you, along with two kids, what does she want? Her kids going to the best school. It's freaking because it's not the state. state. But, it, but that's shrinking though. It, okay. I mean, if you look at the pop, if you look at the school age population in Essex, for example, and I'm sure it's you, you're the same in many many communities. I know it was the, in the town that I lived in before this town, which was another <laughs> five thousand population town. It's gone from six hundred to three hundred in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I mean, you know, like Bob Dylan said, you know, you go and school's all right. You know, you just get used to it. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, it, I, I don't see people moving here for that reason. I see people moving here for retirement. The one that's what I said. That was the speaker we had in Westbrook when we, um, Final, did the final vote for the affordable housing plan she was a graduate of Westbrook High School that lived in New Britain with her husband and two kids and couldn't afford a place in Westbrook where she had her mom available to do child care. And she was very eloquent about needing more um, affordable housing in Westbrook so she could live where she grew up. Well, I agree, I, I but I, that's where the equity comes in. Well, what are we worried about? I mean, in Essex, we're not worried about rich people trying to get a new house, right? I mean, yeah. the housing prices for, for rich people here have, are skyrocketing. There's a guy, no, no uh, there's a house on my block, no water, not even water view, $2.25 million. Yeah, we, I think, backs up to the zone. So, I want to bring us back to the board. I think we can keep underproduction and unit shortage up here. I don't think we have to figure out where precisely in this, whether it needs to be added or whether it is accommodated here. That's something we can play with offline, add some numbers, see where it goes. But the key is we want to make sure that the unit mm -hmm. shortage is included somewhere in our determination. We also know income brackets are going to be something that happens at the determination stage. I want to, I put equity up here. I'm going to move it for now. Um, I want to talk about the rest of what's up here, just so that we can roll stuff out. How do we feel about group quarters? I tend to agree. It's too small, right? Not worth the effort. Well, what about a town like Middletown, where we have a um, college that houses all their students? And we have um, a housing authority. What at least housing authority fit into group quarters? Mm, I don't no, think so. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, you guys aren't the norm. <laughs> we no, don't. I don't know what. <laughs> but, I mean, but the but the reality is is if we're building more a lot more housing in our region, it's going to be in Middletown. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's the reality of it. Yeah. So it's, how about if so, the one is an adjustment then? So if there was material to a, a given municipality, you can throw it as an adjustment. Yeah. An allocation, maybe, when we're looking at allocation. Yeah. It's, it's usually where the adjustment is. Yeah. to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to point out really quick what um, Carla had messaged online a few minutes ago about we're talking, when we are talking about the demographics. Yeah. Um, she said the demographic shift is national and international mm -hmm. um, with decline in children, not, not just reflecting local Connecticut yeah. region. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for allocation, you know, some of them had uh, used jobs mm -hmm. uh, as the allocating factor, but uh, it it seems like it's jobs under a certain income level. Yes, uh, that that because that seems to be you know what is really determined because those are the, because those are you know the the lower paid service workers are the ones who can't usually afford to live in the um, way over a certain income. They're they'll, they'll probably be. But again, this is where are you putting the housing, right? So like, do you want to put housing next to where jobs are, or do you only want to put housing next to the low income jobs? Well, I think now that you have more people are doing remote learning, I think we want remote. Yeah. Um, I think really it's the low income folks, the service folks who can't. Yeah. It, yeah. And it's probably more in the weeds, but it's for the allocation of, you know, it's, for for someone making a lower income, being closer to work is much more important 
than someone making $100,000 who may gonna, choose to be a 40 mile commute. I'm going to throw in a monkey wrench though, yep. which is aside from just the equity of having low income workers, giving them the opportunity to live near the jobs, what about greenhouse gas emissions? Okay. Jobs housing balance. So do we want to put more housing near where the jobs are slash near where the transit is so that we have fewer commute trips? Yeah. Let me ask the question along that line. Where in our region are shopping centers, strip malls being built? Where are Dunkin' Donuts popping up? Where are um, targets being built? You know, you got Boston Post Road. Yeah. You got Middletown. You have... And then you have a smattering of here and there in other places. So right. is that kind of like an amenities thing too? Is like jobs and amenities? Well, like that's where the low, I mean, that's where the, you know, the unskilled workers are yeah. getting jobs. Yeah. And restaurants. Right. Restaurants. Yeah. 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 They just opened up a new big Y, you know, so you know the, yeah. adding some sort of connection there. But I, but I think the transit is, particularly for lower income households, transportation is a is a is a, is a, is a major issue major. because if you can't afford a car, you're limited to you know the transit options. So, transit that plays into the amenities too. Yeah, yeah. You can't get to the grocery store to buy food, not just to work there. Absolutely. So I'm seeing like besides just jobs, I mean jobs could be a proxy for a couple of other things, yeah. <clears throat> but also we're almost looking at not as official as an urban growth boundary situation, but we're kind of looking at clusters of activity. And that could be a variety of different things. So maybe we write activity cluster. Uh, we like the cluster. Economic activity. Granola yeah. clusters. But, but yeah. Chocolate clusters. But like, for, yeah, for example, we have a cluster Clusters along the shoreline along the Boston Bush Road corridor. Mm -hmm. uh, we have medical center, we have supermarkets, we have shopping mm -hmm. there. And you don't have that same analog in Haddam and Lyme and the killing. Yeah. Uh, so coming back up here, do we think cost burden? We had one case study say absolutely not. One said renter only. I put all three mm -hmm. options up here. Do we think that is something that should go in our determination? Do we think it's something that maybe we want to put in our allocation adjustment? If you have a really high share of cost burden households in different income categories, is that something we should adjust your allocation based on? What do we think? Should this be somewhere? So, so cost burden households, there is it's a very general term in that. You know, the cost burden household, they may be living where they want to live already. They're just having problems of, of affordability of where they live. So is that an issue of better voucher programs? Is it better uh, different subsidies? Is it about is it about other interventions potentially than telling them the only solution to your cost being cost burden is for you to move? Well, probably you know, some of them would consider that. They just wasn't anywhere to move. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, we heard that in a couple of case studies, right? Like some of them are saying the vacancy rate is going to take care of that. It's going to give you more flexibility across income brackets to live in an area or in a unit that you are not cost burdened in, simultaneously freeing up your unit for someone else who would also now not be cost burdened. Um, we also heard that uh, there are other opportunities, Sam, like you were saying, for owner-occupied cost burden households, other methods to account for helping them, especially at the lower end of the income bracket, to be not cost burden, and that that might be better. Or maybe you know we could we could not take any of those options, and we could make our own option, and we could say we want to look at cost burden households, but only if you are you know fifty percent or less AMI. So I think that's another. Another result that's going to fall, that's going to come out when you do the, when you do the projected population versus current inventory. Again, if that's categorized by income and you see at below fifty percent AMI, you're short, but at one hundred twenty percent AMI, you have a surplus. Then it, it's not necessarily going to come out as a as a single number, but it'll come out as mismatches in in that grid. Yeah. that'll highlight cost burden to you. And then if you are if you have 
um, let's say you have a, a an indication of a cost burden at the 120 percent level, you can maybe choose to be less diligent about allocating against right. that, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Could, could it could cost burden be part of the equity adjustment? Yeah, I think so. I think that might come under here, and we might put both of these things together as part of our analysis in adjustments over here. And for even, uh, even up in determination, so this is similar to what what we did um, for under production. You know, it needs to be considered, but it, it may be it may be in there already. Mm -hmm. Not not as a plug, but as part of the. And are we thinking, initial math. And are we thinking renter and owner? Just renter? Do we have preference? Okay. Well, well, you think, well, I think I like the criticism of the of the owner issue is that if you have an older retiree who is spending on their assets, they may own their home. <laughs> yes, they're living above their means technically on paper, but because of their age and their retirement plans. Of course, they're they're spending more than what they're bringing because that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. The asset rent is kind of more important for adjustment in this region for sure. Yeah. Um, I can make a comment on the cost burden part. I think it if it would fit anywhere, it would be more under the allocation reason why I'm trying to remember what I remembered in econometrics and in college where. With, with, when we're talking about cost burden, it's really two things that's factored. Person's income and everything that factors into the cost of a, a housing. Mm -hmm. yeah. those, that, those data points is probably going to be collected somewhere else yeah. in the determination when we break down a little bit further. So we don't want to count it twice in that model because it's going it's gonna to buy, buy us or or create correlations that mess things up. Yeah. So keep, I would say, keep it out of determination, but then that can be a consideration when we say, okay, well, we need these units. Where do we want to put them? Then we can start looking at where people are possible. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. I'm also thinking if, for example, you have a high percentage of your population that's cost burdened in, say, the 80% AMI bracket. You would probably want a larger share of those units in, for your municipality, because otherwise they're gonna leave and they're gonna go to another municipality where they can find the housing, right? Or they could downsize. Or they could downsize, you're absolutely right. And then they would know what, that's kind of going back to this vacancy argument, right? Or they could downsize because you're freeing up units in the supply chain at the various brackets. So they might find housing at the, say they're in the 80%, they're living in the one, 120%, and you free up some units in the 80%, they can leave their unit. You've now freed up a 120 unit so that someone who is living above that right now is who is cost burden can move into that unit. A lot of moving pieces. <laughs> so that's really based on the, the interest rate, the very, very current interest rate mm -hmm. thing. That's all parts can't afford to sell our house. Yeah, <laughs> well, same, right? I bought my home. I was fortunate enough to buy in Old Saybrook very early in the pandemic before everyone started rushing to buy houses. I bought a starter home. Yeah. My house is now no longer selling at the price of a starter home, which would be great for me, except there's not another unit that I could afford to move into. So why would I go anywhere? Do we actually know what there's what these numbers are for our product? No, not yet. And so the goal of this, right, is to find out first what we think is important. What can we agree on that we need to consider and look at? And then once we figure that out, we'll look at what the data sources are that can give us this information, and then we'll plug the data in to spit out a number. And we'll see what that looks like. We'll see if it makes sense. Um, what? But doesn't that start? Here's the part that I I, I find, um, and, and it just 
likely my lack of education in this area because I was just a philosophy major as well. <laughs> and, uh, That's why well, we didn't talk about real stuff like you know <laughs> people own you know how many houses and all that stuff. So um but I guess I come back to the question are we trying to decide what our communities want to look like in the future? Are we are we just trying to say okay we're gonna have we have a hundred people now in our in our world, and in five years we're going to have a uh, two hundred. So we got to build some houses, and where are we going to build those houses? And we're going to put those all those new uh, new people in ten years over in one part of town, or are they going to go in the other part of town? So are we? I guess my basic question is: Are we? Have we decided what kind of community we want? So I think that's a really good point. And it's something that Eliza and I talked about a lot when we were putting this together, which is, you know, we have to start with what the projections are, like what's the reality. But then I think to your point, what do we want to be? And Susie, you touched on this as well. What are we trying to do? Who are we trying to accommodate, even if they're not here or they couldn't be here now? And one of the things that came up for us, when we were talking about this initially and, and kind of gaming it out, we were thinking, all right, what if we show negatives? What if we are projecting negative population growth? What if our totals come out to like negative seven units or something like that? But simultaneously, our schools have declining enrollment. Uh, and some of them are looking you know, to possibly be shutting down in the relatively near future. Um, we have empty volunteer vacancies. We don't have firefighters. We can't, everyone is fighting over the same two people to be employed for them in all of the towns. Um, so we have needs for people and how, and that's kind of our question for you too, as we're putting this together. And that's kind of why we put the papers here. Once we get through kind of what is here, what are we missing? You know, and that could be a place where we accommodate who we want to have here. For example, do we want to look at job vacancies, who can't hire people and use that as a number for additional units? That may also, though, if we're doing this vacancy rate, we may find that we're creating units in this vacancy rate um, that cover the number of units we would need for, um, for those jobs. Uh, at least at the outset, that would be part of the reevaluating every so often. If if the vacancy rate is attracting more people, then we need to add more units or up the vacancy rate, for example, because they're no longer vacant because we've attracted more population. Um, so there are different ways to do that, and that would be a question to you as what that measure might be. It's a very good question. Well, I hate to say it, I don't want to end up on the note here, but everything that I see, and I get, I can almost feel it when I, I listen to all the music and I see all the music and I see what's happening. We're, we're headed towards this almost feudal society where there is huge, huge of uh, gaps in, in income. In, in the ability to, to climb the social ladder, the steps are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. When you talk about you can't find, you know, you don't have a starter house anymore, but you can't find another one. So to me, that means the steps on the ladder are getting this, are going like this, yeah. right? Yeah. When, we're, when what we need to do is try and get the steps that go like this. So, I mean, you're not wrong, but unfortunately, we're kind of, where we are well, here, we're kind of only you're a philosopher, you never <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things are not within our control, but what we can do is take a look at housing and try and plan for more housing as at least one part in fixing yeah, that. Well, I'm assuming this is kind of an iterative process because if we if we describe the model and you come back and say, I, I can't, this number doesn't exist. 
but that one does. Yeah. Then we might want to relook at the model mm -hmm. to accommodate those two changes. Exactly. And kind of say, okay, what's the implication for town X? And oh, maybe what will they say? But it's but it's very iterative. Exactly. It's, this is kind of a beginning way to describe the problem. Exactly. And excluding kind of national stuff. I mean, uh, is, is you know, are we going to have immigration? Are we not going to have immigration? It's like this huge switch that's outside of this model. Um, yeah. A lot of but, but starting kind of putting, putting borders around it. Exactly. It's exactly right. And if that's the goal for the next workshop that we'll have in our next quarter. We'll take all this back. And like I said, we'll try and figure out what some of this means based on the data that we have. And we'll have that discussion. And so the next time, you'll see one big board that has one you know, formula on it and we can, we'll put all of the alternatives up and we can play with that um, and plug in different things and see what that means. Or maybe we'll be more high tech. Maybe we'll do it on the screen. Um, maybe we'll up our budget for the project. <laughs> um, but you're right, like we may not have all of this data. We may not be able to do this. But I think these conversations are really important for us as your staff to understand what it is that's important and how, and to make sure that one way or another, somewhere in here, we're accounting for it so that the numbers that spit out at the end make sense to everybody and you understand what went into it and why it's important. In, in that sense, I would say first iteration simpler is better. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe we put these as, I want, let's see. How about I just write on here? Is this covered? Big question mark. <laughs> and we'll check. We'll plug stuff in and we'll check. Which one is that? I think it's okay. under production and unit shortage. Okay, thank you. Okay, last one up here is homeless population. We have to figure out if the census covers it. So I'm going to suggest that we put that under projected population and we'll say, Check then this. Homeless, you'd have to. I know, I know um, one person in Middletown that really has a great tab on the homeless population in Middletown, where he <laughs> probably knows most of them by name. Yeah. You know, so I think that's a data point, at least at our level, that we can probably estimate pretty well. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know about the rest of them. That would be the thing, right? Like, can we extrapolate that? Is that a data set that can be applied? Or would it have to be something, you know, that we're looking at over here or over here, perhaps? You know, if you have a larger share of homeless population, do you get an adjustment up of your total units? That well, I think... I was just going to say, I think it's also important to define how homeless is being calculated here because unsheltered is what most people think about when they think about homeless people. But a lot of people without homes for whom a home being built would be an important part of a regional housing assessment are actually couch surfing um, or sleeping in, you know, they're sleeping in a hotel when they can, right? So I think that there are, it, it's important to define it before you can account for it. Yeah, we do have a pretty small percentage of homelessness in our region as compared with everywhere else too. So I think we need to think about if we're discounting some groups because they're too small for us to count. And I hate to say that about the unhoused population because I, I think it's worthy, but from a study that I recently did, it, it's like two to 3% and like 99% of that's in Middletown. Yeah. But as and to Carla's point, you you can't find those other people necessarily. Exactly. And well, well, just looking at like the homelessness rates by state, 
Connecticut's at the bottom. We're we're actually in a good position mm -hmm. when it comes to homelessness. The uh, the top is New York State, where you're having about um, over 50, like fifty five homeless people per ten thousand residents, and we're at the level of about seven. So so we're so we're we're we're, we're at on the low end for for homelessness. And I bet you most of that because outside of Middle, Middletown is unique, but outside of Middletown, I bet you the uh, social service in in the in the um, selectman's office knows Joe Pete Susan. Right. And, and it might be a small enough number that it may not necessarily need to be a collection. If, if we're talking about building units for people that are homeless, we need to think about where those are. You're not going to build them in lines or killing work. You're going to build them in Middletown because that's the only place that has services in our region, like real services. So I want to bring this back. There's another way we might account for it. I put homeless population up here because we're going to check the census to see what is counted. Uh, we're also, I added, how are we defining homeless population? One thing that we might do to Eliza's point, because that might be difficult to count or it might be very small, um, we might just add a blanket plus, you know, X percent yeah. at whatever income bracket. Maybe we would assume you know, the lower end, so 50, some for the 50 bracket, some for the 30 bracket, or depending on how we break that down, additional units for those income brackets to accommodate for homelessness, which we don't have an accurate count on. Homeless adjustment. Yeah. You got and you have to make some assumptions, I think, when you're doing that number. I just um, want to say, this was my attempt to write that down. <laughs> so thank you, Marcos. So with that online, is that Ben? Yeah, I was just gonna mention that um, within this context of the homelessness tracking, I mean, this is a traditionally highly difficult thing to figure out what the origin of is. If you're gonna look at things traditionally, I, I would suggest if, if you're seeing concentrations in Middletown, it's most likely because people are heading into Middletown where the services are. And it's really hard to track especially like within the CAN system that looks at where people are coming from. It's using last known registered addresses often, which can fluctuate if someone has experienced what was described as the couch surfing prior to getting accounted for within the system. So if you're looking at it I, on an individual town by town basis, you're probably not going to really account for much. You're just going to say, oh, well, we don't really have a homelessness problem. But if you're seeing it all in one place, it, you know, I would think of that as, you know, consider the fact that people, you know, from Hartford may, you know, from the towns outside of Hartford may go to Middletown or people from within the region may go to Middletown, but look at the numbers as a whole and also be aware that the rates in the last year and a half have, I think, skyrocketed something like 14 or 15 percent. Um, if you look at 211, another um, really great uh, way to track some of this internally for the region is look at 211 call center numbers, which are tracked. Um, people will, um, the number of calls within that, like regarding, like when people call up, they say, oh, I'm calling because I'm experiencing or I'm on the cusp of experiencing homelessness. And so the 211 numbers are usually also capture where people are calling from as well. Um, and it's just another way to kind of try to account for this, but it's highly difficult to do. And that's just a comment. Thank you, Ben. Um, so I added that thought here for vacancy rate. And then I also added homelessness to the adjustment. So we've wrapped up our determination board. So we've got this to take back with us. I think that's looking pretty good, actually. So we're going to look at allocation now. And we kind of started talking about it. So what do we think about at least part of the allocation being based on share of population growth? That was a pretty common one. Yeah. Okay. Share, share population growth within the state. Within the region, because we're doing this all at the regional so level. From region down. To yeah. So I mean, for us, I mean, so in all of the case studies, it started at the state level. The state dispersed to the regions, and then the regions did the allocation of dispersed to the municipalities. We're the regions, so we're doing both. 
So it's from us to us and <laughs> to the to the municipalities. Um, so yeah, this would be regional share. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. You know, you could either project out based on your current proportional share of the regional population and say based on what your current share is, we're gonna say, you know, that's gonna continue onwards. Um or you can look specifically at the projected growth if we can get it. But again, we're guys of a limit right now. So if we can get it, looking at the projected growth by municipality. And it doesn't have to be, you know, the whole distribution, but it could be part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. We already have activity clusters. I think that was a good one. Um, and we can talk about, you know, we've got jobs. We had kind of thought, Opportunity or maybe amenities is better. Kind of goes with these activity clusters. Where's the stuff? Services versus amenities. Yeah. Opportunity though is a, is a defined term, at least in Connecticut. So it's the the impact of someone living in an area okay. socioeconomically. So we want to stick with this as defined as term. a as a yeah as a defined term. I okay. Think. But I don't not have that definition. Not to explain. Not to exclude. I mean, there was that whole. I forget the. Um, it was with CHFA, mm -hmm. where the, the formula for opportunity changed, yeah. and yeah. there was uh, it affected funding. So it's it's kind of a reserved concept. Okay, if I you want to use it in that context. Yeah, I mean, I put it up here based on the case studies. Opportunity index was something that came up in a couple of them, so yeah. I added it here. We can. And I think that's the what word, they were talking but, about the as an opportunity index. That's yeah, it. but I mean that like loosely. It was defined differently in the different case studies, you know, depending on where you were. Um, we could use a different term for it for our own purposes. Yeah, I just amenities. mentioned that. No, and, uh, yeah, amenities, yeah, so which we have. <laughs> so I will put amenities here. And I'm also going to add, or maybe you want to write a new one for services. <laughs> So, you know, that could be some kind of an index of, you know, and this is something we would play with and figure out, but the more of each of these things you have, you're given a score and based on your score, your allocation changes or something like that. So for all of these over here, and in fact, I think I'm going to, that really didn't do much. How do we feel about transit? Is that, part of activity cluster or, you know, I know we don't have a lot of transit here. We do have the three shoreline East stations. We have the Middletown transit terminal. Um, our routes, I would not, I would not say we have um, any rapid routes in the region, but we do, these are assets. We are doing TOD planning. Um, it is, in my perspective, a good idea to concentrate more housing around transit or with good access to transit. So we could use this either in conjunction with these, you get a higher score on your index if you have transit, or it could be that a certain percentage of the allocation, a certain percentage of these future units are allocated based on whether or not you have transit. Any preference? I really think it needs to be important because it's mm -hmm. it's a little bit iterative in the same was on the all the emails about about getting the shoreline east schedule back. And one of the rumors was the reason they took it away is because the towns along the line aren't serious about transit oriented development, which, which is probably a lack of understanding of what's been tried, but yeah. but still I think it needs to be important. And and I just, uh, along those lines, um, uh, you had made a comment about how, you know, we're just, we're, we're loose, uh, we're not even a confederation of towns. Well, I think, I think the idea that, that the town can voluntarily come up with some sort of methodology, I think is, is an important, is an important step, especially as the state has been tasked with coming up with a methodology. Um, and what was, what was before in the mandate for the study coming up with the methodology was uh, with, well, it was relatively basic and, and coming up with something that we might arguably say is, is better and more more refined to our region, I think serves could serve our towns well. 
even if we don't have the best mechanism to implement it. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go because I got another number you can make. Thank you for your comments. So we've got population transit activity clusters um, as kind of our base allocation. And then we've got all of these things that might be adjustments. So basically, one thing we would think about is we might want to make some of these adjustments as we run through the numbers. We may find that the same places, I'm thinking Middletown specifically, are going to have the highest population growth. They've got the bus terminal and they've got a lot of activity clusters. That's going to be a large, they're going to get this portion, this portion, and this portion. That's a lot of units for Middletown, whereas in other places will maybe only have the population growth. That may be fine. It may be really heavily weighted. Or that's where cost burden fits in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that gets us to our adjustments. So the goal of the adjustments would be to fix anything that's too high or too low based on the original allocations by looking at different things. I think buildable land is a really important one, right? Like mm -hmm. how much of your space is actually buildable? And again, I don't mean like vacant, but I mean, is it wetland? Is it steep slope? Is it something that you literally cannot put a house on? Um, so I think the more buildable land you have, the more it makes sense. Um, and the more you know, important open space habitat conservation land, and we can talk about what goes into those. Um, your your number of units should be reduced. You just don't have the space. We don't want to you know demolish wetlands, fill them in in order to put up apartments. That's not what we're trying to do. Um, Group quarter adjustment, we could accommodate um, Leslian in that case. Um, we could talk about what we would want to include in group quarters. Do we have any initial ideas? We've got university, senior center. Um, yeah, okay. Could um, could we somehow fit homelessness into that input? Into adjustment? Like yeah. into the group quarters. Oh, like in shelters, because, right. but no, I think because when you're talking group quarters, you're reducing your number of units because they're not people that need to right. be in the right. right. short term. Right. Right. It's not really, right? It's transitional. Yeah. Um, you'd think, you'd hope it to be. So the yeah. goal would be that the homeless population mm -hmm. would eventually have a home independently. So we got senior center, university, and group quarters. By well, senior center, we mean like nursing homes, right? Yeah. Okay. People that will not graduate from. Right. Okay. Because I'm thinking like the senior center in town, so you go and hang out with your friends. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's what I'm here for. Um, infrastructure. Do you have sewer and water? And this kind of goes hand in hand with buildable Ooh. land. So, question on that one. Mm -hmm. Should that be a primary allocation factor and not an adjustment? And the reason I'm asking that is it seems like the adjustments were typically impairments. So it's gonna it's gonna push the number down and leave it hanging. So if and at the I'll, I'll look to Middletown for this because and, and the towns that have more infrastructure, because so I'm looking at it from a line which doesn't have it, it would be a mat, it would be a huge investment for relatively few units to run sewer and the whole notion of putting a sewage treatment plant on the banks of the Connecticut River is probably going to be a challenge. So we're dependent on New London for that. So the question is, do you make your initial allocation based on available infrastructure, not necessarily infrastructure that needs to be created, rather than having a lack of infrastructure start to dr drive the, the count down and leave it dangling with no, with no recourse? So here's what I'm thinking, and I definitely see your point. I'm thinking if you don't have sewer and water, you're likely going to have a small projection of population growth. You're probably not going to be you know, one of the municipalities that has access to transit. You might, but you may not. And you probably are low on this activity cluster because there's probably not a lot of development there now. So 
your allocation would probably already be smaller. So I think this, and if you don't have sewer and water, that doesn't mean you can't build. I'm thinking, for example, Baybrook Station, right? right? <clears throat> so I think if your buildable land doesn't have infrastructure, then that would be a greater reduction than if your buildable land does. That's how I would do it. But I definitely see your point also, and I would say- Yeah, not all the way there. That was a, that was a question. It's also <laughs> local accommodation. Yeah. Where does it fit? Uh, yeah, I kind of think it's 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 important in the same way that the train stations are, because it's um really makes a difference into. Yeah, it does in whether you can. Well, let me ask a question mm -hmm. about um because I think this uh, it, we've been here for not, almost two hours and that's the first time we talked about the cost. Yeah. The dollar cost of anything we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, in yeah. your in the you know out, out in the middle of town, but in your communities, Different are level. you not? Is there physical like environmental reasons why water serve sewer and water is not expanded, or is it mostly primarily physical? Both. Well, I think it's it, both. Yeah, I don't think it's a direction because then, then more people will come. It's an incentive mm -hmm. in many towns to not have in oh, oh, right. yeah. as, right. as a way to not have a lot of units right. allocated. So, so is that an accommodate local accommodation that maybe if there's a growing need for more housing, maybe you have to right. swallow the pill a little bit? Sorry, right, guys. I just realized that it is three forty-five, and I have to let my husband know that he has to pick my daughter up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where that kind of Are we yeah. um, are we stopping at four? Is that hard to stop? Yeah, because so, I I have to be leaving. Yeah, I think so. yeah. We were planning to stop at three thirty, but uh, yeah. So let's do this quickly, because all we have to do is clear this. I think, personally, opportunity is covered here. I don't see what other adjustment or opportunity would change based on jobs, amenities, services, mm -hmm. right? The reason we park it, we make sure it's covered. I put infrastructure on local accommodations also. We'll look at it in both places. Um, Existing share of units, this is kind of an equity thing and also a cost burden thing, right? Because we're looking at what is your share in different income brackets. Do you have too much of any one kind? We can adjust up or down. We could also possibly include a cost burden adjustment if it's at the lower end of the income spectrum. That could work. Or we could do it across the board. We could see what both of them look like. You know, some of those models and case studies, equity was was recognition of a disproportionately positive contribution in the past. Yeah. So it would be at a an decrease. Or you well, know, an increase yeah. if yeah. you don't have enough. So and some of the, and I think some of them had it at the front end too. Not yeah. as an adjustment, but as a as a primary. Some of them, so California had it as believe no that was here wasn't it equity mm -hmm. up or down yeah allocation yeah um it's a primary allocation factor not an adjustment post hoc it was an adjustment in california up or down yeah um uninhabitable units again i think we might be back up here you know yes with our existing unit so well i'm gonna park that there is it covered um, and homelessness, we talked about possibly having that as an adjustment as well. Did we decide if we want all cost burden or just rental? rental? Mm -hmm. Any strong feeling? I think so. Both. So, both. Yeah. I'm not comfortable yeah. not including ownership. In okay, so that's our starting point. Beautiful. Can I one thing just because I'll forget next time? Yeah. But the buildable land does that account for um reuse, like adaptive reuse yep, is already in that. Yep. All right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's anything yeah. that's not environmentally or otherwise constrained to the point where you can't build on it. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there. Oh, my hair hurts. <laughs> As put as inputs Take care. Thank you. You Let's get a motion to adjourn here. <laughs> Second. Second. Okay. Got it. Second. Kind of like David Lam. All right. All in right. favor? Aye. 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 Are these souvenirs or do we need to? Yeah, you can take them. Um, right next to Oh, yeah. Um, you go to the bedroom, right around right the corner. I mean, we'll yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, they go to the shower room, but just the bedroom has more room. Yes. Yeah. 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 Go around. Go to the master's. Yeah. 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 The notion of the see you guys tomorrow morning. Yeah. 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 Ye